to what's up everybody and welcome back to the sit down a crime and mafia podcast i'm really excited for today's show i am jeff nadu as always we're back another show uh this has really been a great couple of weeks we've had some great shows we've done you know the mafia cops and nikki scarfo and vincent giganti and you know last week john Gotti. but this week we're going to take a little bit of a a different direction with the show. And when I started this uh, show, I knew I was going to do this episode and I knew that I was going to kind of roll into different uh, organized crime groups and a organized crime group that no one talks about outside of my city of Philadelphia is uh, the Philadelphia Black Mafia. Now, I think a lot of people get it confused with groups like BMF, which is the Black Mafia family, which is a totally different group uh, that came, you know, came many years later. But um, the guest that I'm bringing on today, I've always been fascinated by this subject, being because it's a Philadelphia subject, and I think it has so many ties to right now in really the makeup of what Philadelphia has become, um, connections to the Nation of Islam, and really some of the more heinous crimes in the history of this city and by this city uh, were committed by people that were in the Black Mafia. So I'm really excited to do this show. I'm glad everybody's enjoying the show, and I thank everybody for checking it out. Uh, I'm really excited for our guest today. He's a guy that I got to be honest, I've been following for many years. As I said, I've been fascinated by this subject for a lot of years. And um, I read his book, um, Black Brothers Incorporated, which is really one of the great books you'll find. If you if you enjoy organized crime and, and kind of um, you know, a black organized crime history, it's a great book. It's, it's about the rise and fall of the most violent uh, Philadelphia black mafia family. And he also wrote a great book um called um gaming the game the story behind the nba betting scandal and the gambler who made it happen which is about uh rogue ref tim donahy and and some of the the behavior that he was up to all of it very good and fascinatingly enough uh, it kind of connects to my other life which is the gambling business but uh, he's a professor at the citadel uh, he's a former police officer in the city of philadelphia and he's a extensive researcher uh, one of the great authors of of, of criminality and, and crime uh, Sean Patrick Griffin joins the show. Sean, it's a big honor to have you on. Thank you very much, Jeff. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I really, um, I, I've kind of always uh, been a fan of yours. I've read your books. I enjoy your your work. And, you know, I, I've always credited you. I remember many years ago, BET did a show called American Gangster. And I think a lot of people um, that were familiar and enjoyed crime history have watched the show. Uh, and they did a, 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 a show on the Black Mafia. And I remember you were kind of integral in that. And that's where I think I probably first came across you. But you, you've extensively researched these topics. And I think you were the first real purveyor of, of the Black Mafia. And I know, obviously, there were research done way before you. But you've kind of been the, the, the lead on this throughout. Well, it's interesting because I, I get credit for that a lot. There, there was a great book written in 1974 by an anthropologist named Francis A.J. Iani uh, called Black Mafia. He was making a broader point, though. He wasn't focusing on a particular syndicate like I did. He was explaining to his colleagues, my colleagues, the idea that organized crime was not specific to Italians, which at that point in time was standard fare in academia and in the media. And it got ignored, not because the research wasn't incredible. The book is so heavily documented, you can't doc, you can't debate what he was saying. The problem was his conclusion said, now keep in mind, this is being written in the late 60s, early 70s. And his argument was there was a thing called ethnic succession and organized crime. And his argument was that the rise of Puerto Rican and black mafias was going to come at the expense of Italians because Italians were be obviously becoming assimilated into the culture. Because his conclusion was wrong, people ignored the rest of the book and discounted the idea, well, of course, there would be organized crime in other groups beyond Italians. And let me just say, Jeff, you didn't ask this question, but your audience needs to know this. The only reason his argument was flawed, when I do this in my class, I draw a circle on the, on the board as a pie. And Iani's argument was there's a finite amount of organized crime in existence. And so by definition, if you get black gangsters or Hispanic gangsters, they come at the expense, they cut into the part of the pie for the Italians. What Iani didn't consider was that the pie 
That is, the market could just grow. And it didn't have to necessarily come at the expense of Italians. And that's what happened. So if he didn't just happen to get the conclusion wrong, the rest of the book is poetry. It's incredible. And when I wrote Black Brothers years ago, I, wrote, I started writing that book in the 90s. One of the first things I relied upon was W.E.B. Du Bois' book, The Philadelphia Negro, which was written in 1899. He talks about black organized crime then. Right. Back then, of course, it was called Negro Vice. Right. And because if you're a graduate student or a media person and you're trying to do research into black organized crime, well, you can search Lexus Nexus all you like. You're not going to find it because for, forever it was called Vice and you had to look to know what you were looking for. So um, I'm, I'm happy that people say that. And look, part of the reason that Black Brothers was such a big deal is still, it's still selling it very few. 15 years old now, um, is because for whatever reason, people just ignored this topic. And look, you and I are going to talk about Philadelphia's Black Mafia, and I'll tell you this. When that book came out and I was on national radio, I did two huge national radio shows, two hours each. They were, by the way, they were only originally scheduled for 20 minutes each, and the calls just coming in and coming in. So both times they got expanded. I'd be on national satellite radio and people would call in, call in from Atlanta. Hey, you talked about Major Coxon. My neighbor had had a Major Coxon. Call from Detroit. You talk about Sam Christian. My neighbor had had. It just turned out that Black Brothers was the first book documenting things that people who lived in those sorts of neighborhoods in the 60s and 70s, they knew this. Mm -hmm. And somebody was just finally telling the story. Yeah, it's really fascinating because, I, you know, you mentioned how, you know, Obviously, Italian organized crime is kind of the, the king of it all. I mean, it's, it's always gotten the love. It's always gotten the, the affection of, of an American that, that enjoys organized crime. But it's fascinating that they never kind of put two and two together, that there were organized groups of people in these areas that were controlling things. They were really and, and that's, I think, one thing when, when we talk about the black mafia in Philadelphia, keep in mind when it was kind of starting to be formed in, in the 60s. Philadelphia was kind of an interesting place. It was kind of the, a cauldron, if you will. There was a, a mayor that was an Italian mayor that had obviously a, an iron fist in the black communities. He was going in there. He was either not going in there or going in there too much and, and really just kind of upheavaling everything. And, and you know, obviously the, the places like the nation were starting and this black separate, this movement was starting where they were kind of becoming, you know, enthused and enlightened and saying, you know what, we're going to, you kind of create our own groups and we're going to have everything black owned and, and we're going to take a lot of pride in the neighborhoods and we're going to bring all this stuff in. And obviously out of that, and it's, it's no, no different than when, you know, Italians would come over here from, from Italy and they would go into these areas and they would be kind of disrespected or, or, or not be made into the same America as everyone else. And they kind of said, you know, what, we're going to make our own groups. And that led to crime and that led to groups like the black mob. And it's important to understand as well, I always want to talk, whenever we bring up a topic, there are certain players that are involved in each topic. And the names we're going to obviously remember are Sam Christian, Ron Harvey, who are kind of the, the, the two soothsayers of the business. They were the, the, the creators of this group, particularly Sam Christian. Um, we're going to center it around Philadelphia. And there's an important connection here, um, obviously being from this area. Um, it's important to understand that in Philadelphia, even to this day, um, Islam is the lead religion in most black neighborhoods. It is a majority Islamic city. Now, if you go down to the Italian neighborhoods or into Port Richmond and the Northeast, Catholicism being a Catholic, but in the Muslim neighborhoods, most African-American families are in Islamic, the Islamic faith and the Islamic teaching. So when we connect the nation, when we connect uh, Islam, um, in different cities, as you know, Sean, um, even over in Detroit or even in Baltimore, Washington, Islam was kind of an adopted religion because of groups like the nation back in the 60s with Malcolm X. Well, here's the thing. I never did the math on what percentage of Philly was Muslim, um, let alone keep in mind we're talking about the 60s and 70s. There's a huge difference then what was a black Muslim versus a Muslim. Uh, and we can probably get into that later. Uh, I just know that back in the 60s and 70s, when the Nation of Islam was thriving as a black separatist movement and as a black power movement, they were Philadelphia was one of the biggest black Muslim cities in the country. And just to remind your listeners, and I know this is complicated, before Elijah Muhammad died in 1975, 
if you said black Muslims, it meant one thing. Mm -hmm. followers, followers of the Nation of Islam, and they had a certain set of values. When Elijah Muhammad died in February of 75, the, the, the whole movement split right. into three different movements. So now when you say black Muslim, it means totally different things to totally different people. But in the 60s and 70s, man, it was a very powerful movement. I have had so many people at book signings come up to me and talk to me about their role in the movement. I had one great guy who told me that uh, if he had not been drafted into the Vietnam War, I would have been writing about him because he was in the Nation of Islam, in Philly, in Temple 12. There were 56 mocks around the country, all numbered by city. Philly was Temple, Temple 12. And he said, I was so for all that. I knew all the guys you wrote about. I believed in all that. And I could have justified anything back then. I was so militant. Um, so it's hard for us to imagine now, looking back, what a big deal that was. But, you know, and, and for those of uh, your listeners who don't know this, there's a great anecdote in Black Brothers Incorporated where uh, people on the street said, back then, you could have a brand new Cadillac in the late 60s, early 70s, roll the windows down, put Muhammad Speaks, the official newspaper of the Nation of Islam, on the dashboard and leave the keys in the ignition. And no one is touching that car. That's how respected and feared the nation was back then. So when Philadelphia's Black Mafia's leadership was totally populated by people in the nation, and in fact, they were mostly members of the Fruit of Islam, the paramilitary group that were responsible for security and protection of the nation and the mosques, uh, you can imagine why people were fearful of the group. Yeah, and I think now, you know, when we hear Nation of Islam, you know, I, as you, you know, succinctly talked about, there have really been two different nations. You know, back then it was... Uh, you know, standing up and controlling your community. It was the Black separatist movement. It was, you know, empowering, you know, young African-Americans and older African-Americans in general to really kind of be their own driving force in their own communities. Now, you know, once Elijah Muhammad dies, it's become a real different group. And, you know, now when you look at, and when you look at Islam as a whole, um, you know, when you speak to, to, to mainstream Muslims, they don't even at this point recognize the nation because it is, went into such a totally different realm of, of where it is. I mean, considering this, that the Southern Poverty Law Center has, has dictated it, that it's a, a hate group, basically. And, and Louis Farrakhan has, has really kind of changed, I think, the narrative of what uh, the nation has stood for. But, you know, when we look into the late 50s and the 60s, this was a, a place, as you said and, and, and talked about, that, you know, the nation was a respected group. Malcolm X was part of it. Um, you know, they, they created something called the Fruit of Islam, as you said, which was a kind of a security force inside the nation that would, would run through these temples and mosques, and they would kind of control everything and make sure everything was running swiftly and, and, and succinctly. Um, but in 1964, there, there's rumblings that there's criminality going on in these mosques, and in particularly at Temple 12 in Philadelphia, which was, as you know, run by a guy called Jeremiah Shabazz. Now, Jeremiah Shabazz was kind of the, 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 the de facto leader. He had a lot of connections to criminality. And by this time in the black communities in South Philadelphia and West Philly and, and these places, the black mafia is already being created. It was kind of the shady underworld that were kind of creating street taxes and controlling the, the drug dealers and the pimps and the, the numbers runners and everybody in the city of Philadelphia that was in the black communities. They were basically acting as the mafia in those areas and controlling things. And through... How did, and, and I guess this was always a question I had, how did, I, I guess, from what I understand, Sam Christian uh, connects into the nation. He starts taking over the fruit of Islam in Philadelphia under Jeremiah Shabazz, and that's kind of how they get connected. Well, obviously that level of detail, we'll never know what precipitated Sam Christian or Moody Mims or that whole first generation of black mafia guys to get into the nation. But as I described years ago, one of the amazing things about it, and I look, I'm a former police officer, so I always think about things from uh, a law enforcement perspective. What they did was genius because once they affiliated with the nation, they got protection. It wasn't simply that they changed their names, obviously, so they all adopt Muslim names, which makes tracking them harder for law enforcement. This is before the internet, obviously. So their names changed. So now there are two names, at least, for each of these guys. But 
Back then, this is before 9-11, way before 9-11, you couldn't get a search warrant for a house of worship. So <laughs> you could hide people in mosques. You could transport people between mosques. You could hide weapons in mosques. It was genius. Yes. Now, I don't know if they knew all of that before they did this or if it was just a nice side benefit. I can only tell you when when you're law enforcement trying to track down murders or conspiracies, you got a hard time ahead of you because you can't get access to the places where they're hiding. It's smart. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting because I, I remember the great uh, and I know you know this guy, Jim Nicholson. He wrote for the Daily News, he's an investigative journalist and had a lot of writings into the black mafia really kind of cracked i feel like the case of them but i remember and i think it was in the black uh, mafia american gangster he talked about you know who's going to kick in the front doors of a mosque it was a really good cover in a way to basically conduct business and do things and you know again the the black community at that point didn't trust you know the government they didn't trust the the police they didn't trust anybody so whatever crimes would be perpetrated, which we'll get into by the black mafia. And as they grow, you know, they would always kind of be the ones that people thought did it, but no one could ever really prove it. No one would ever call them out. And, and at the end of the day, they knew that the people that were in the nation in those mosques were going to believe them a lot of the time. And they could always just blame and say, well, we know the police are corrupt and we know they're not going to tell the truth. And of course we didn't do that, but it was great cover. And it was really, as you said, intelligent to do when they're founded and do we know, I know there's a lot of questions. The, the original group, I think a lot of people consider it formed in the late sixties, but you believe, and I'm guessing would believe that it was formed before then. There's no real way of knowing though, right? Yeah, well, the reason, the reason I say it was formed before then, this goes to the point I made earlier where if, if you're a researcher and you're just for whatever reason, trying to look into a crime group decades ago, well, in my case, if people didn't know there was this group calling itself the Black Mafia, well, there's nothing to research. You can't look for news clippings. You can't look for court records. You can't look for law enforcement intelligence files. There's nothing there. So until you figure out who's in the group and what they're doing, you can't start researching. Well, after however many years I was doing this, I finally had a good sense of what, they, what the group looked like. So then I went back into news clippings and into court records and law enforcement files. And so the done, what you, describe, what you discover is you find clusters of the same guys that we're all going to know as Philadelphia Black Mafia members clearly by the early 70s. You see groups of them being arrested together in the late 50s. Now, that doesn't mean they were an organized crime group in the late 50s, but they knew each other. They were involved in criminal, criminal activity back then. So when they became a formal group calling themselves the Black Mafia, we'll never know. And by the way, Jeff, that's an important point, too. I get asked a lot over the, year, over the years, well, who's calling them the Black Mafia? The law enforcement, the media, you? No. On the street, they call themselves the Black Mafia for good reason. If your group, as Philly's Black Mafia was, based on extortion, originally they started on extortion, meaning threatening people, with acts of violence or murder to get something in, in advance. So usually there's money, maybe it's a drug corner, maybe it's a bar, whatever, it's extortion. Uh, and that's racketeering, is organized extortion. Well, the only way you can do that and get credibility is to be violent and to have a calling card. Well, their calling card was, we're the Black Mafia. So the only reason law enforcement started getting hints of this it wasn't that they were looking for it. They were just interviewing murder suspects or murder victims, not murder victims, but um, people who are being investigated, investigated with regard to murders. And they would say, oh, well, this is a black mafia hit. So you see mentions of that in law enforcement files, but it's not like the organized crime unit had a file or a room dedicated to this. Right. I only discovered it years after the fact. They didn't even know it existed. They didn't know it was in their own files that they had connected the dots. And by the way, Jeff, that's related to a question you asked earlier. It's hard for people to remember, but those early organized crime units that started in the mid-60s all around the country after the McClellan hearings in 63, they were all, some, like New York's was called the Italian squad. They, when I say they focused on Italians, I mean literally they were exclusively focused on right. Italians. They really thought 
there was a nationwide conspiracy of Italian immigrants who were subversive. They really believed that. So all the resources went to that. And unsurprisingly, there were Italian American gangsters. So that fed news articles, which generated public opinion. It made movies. It then motivated law enforcement and public policy. And it became a vicious cycle. Well, all the other gangsters were loving it because they were okay, great, focus on the Italians. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And, you know, when you look into the late 60s, and as you said, it could have been, you know, they had formed even as, as small, you know, fringe groups, you know, in the, in the 50s at some point. Uh, these were criminals. And these were guys that knew each other. Uh, they're from the same neighborhoods, guys like Sam Christian and Ma Harvey and all these different guys. Um, when you look into the late 60s and when they kind of officially formed, as I said before, um, they were running around in these neighborhoods, in black neighborhoods, and they were controlling things. They were controlling numbers. They were controlling drugs. They were controlling prostitution. They were controlling card games. They were creating capital uh, and turning it into legitimate business and then black owned business. Now, remember in South Philadelphia at the time, which is where a lot of this was done, um, you know, over in what's present day, like Point Breeze and, and over in those areas, um, keep in mind, Angela Bruno ran South Philadelphia, he ran the Philadelphia Mafia at the time. And we talked about this in the Nikki Scarfo show. One of the downfalls of Angelo Bruno and many who are close to him and knew, know about him know this is he would not allow his own subordinates to sell drugs, but he had no problem taking drug money from people uh, like, um, you know, black run groups. You know, the Cherry Hill Gambinos who were part of the Gambino crime family. And if you look at the black mafia in the early days, a lot of the drug they were being supplied with were directly from um, the Philadelphia Italian mafia. And, you know, in later, it, through people like Frank Matthews, who uh, in American history is one of the biggest drug traffickers in the history of the city, in this country. Um, and obviously in some of the things that we'll get into down the road with, you know, Tyrone Palmer and people like that. But that was really the, the, the start of the nexus of them. And then, as we said, as the nation of Islam becomes more and more prominent, people like Sam Christian, who is the de facto leader, they kind of head in to become uh, part of the nation. They take over fruit of Islam duties. And Jeremiah Shabazz, who was from Philadelphia, he was the prominent member. He uh, had all sorts of businesses. Uh, he basically allowed this to be done. Uh, and that's what really kind of started kind of the connection to the nation, the criminality going on. Because as you know, uh, Sean, what did they call a Temple 12 in Philadelphia? What was it called? You can you can enlighten us on that. Yeah. Well, it was called one of two things. It was either called the Hudma Mas, which is what I chaptered one of my title, one of my one of my chapters, uh, or some people called it the Hit Mosque. You know, hit as in murder. Right. And basically, how, you know, by the way, just to be clear for your listeners who don't know this, there were plenty of other Nation of Islam mosques back then that were. Uh, aggressive, shall we say. So for Philly to stand out as the hit mosque or a herbal mosque was saying something. Right. And you're totally right. I think a lot of one of the sentiments that made Malcolm X, you know, ultimately leave the nation of Islam and go to Sunni Islam was the fact that there was a lot of criminality being done. And people like Jeremiah Shabazz were basically allowing it to happen. They were in, in, in some aspects, Shabazz was ordering things to be done. Uh, and really the growth of organized black crime in Philadelphia started. Now, again, I don't think we're, we're none of us are going to say that this is when crime began, but this is where the prominent organized crime began. And again, there's a lot of connections to present day, which we'll get into down the road. But, you know, it's interesting because the black mafia, once they were created, used all these different meetings. They had legal businesses and nonprofits as cover. And as Sean alluded to, they used the mosque as a front to the business. And let's remember, they were doing good things in the community. Uh, they were creating schools. They were creating businesses. They were creating things for the children and the people of, of Philadelphia and the black communities, but they were doing it through crime. And, you know, weirdly enough, um, and I think, you know, kind of in the misguided romanticism of crime in general, even in Italian neighborhoods, you know, today we've always... And even in, as you know, today in black uh, neighborhoods in Philadelphia, the nation is still connected. I mean, there are still many groups that have connected themselves to the black mafia today. But when we get into the 60s, Malcolm X leaves the nation. It kind of becomes uh, taken over by 
you know, Elijah Muhammad kind of takes control and he continues the, you know, the, the, the separatism and everything going on. But this is where the black mafia kind of turns inward and becomes a true criminal organization. And it's run by Jeremiah Shabazz, basically. He dictates what goes on. Well, I've never, I've always been very careful in my language there because it's, 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 you can easily say Jeremiah Shabazz should have or likely knew of much of what we all now know. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost incredible to believe neighborhoods knew, victims knew, police knew all the things that were going on in this mosque and he didn't know. As far as him, Dick, and, and, and he also benefited greatly from all this. As far as him knowing a lot of it, I don't know, and I'll tell you why. And I'm not, I get criticized for defending him. I'm not defending him, but I'm just speaking technically here. Same thing with Mayor Shrew when the corruption scandal happened in 2003, and people said, oh my gosh, he had to know, he had to. Know. That's not really how this works if it's done correctly. It, it's it's possible, if not likely, that somebody like Jeremiah Shabazz knew that he had a group of people around him that were rough dudes who were going to take care of things. And it was in his benefit for him not to know what they were doing. Right. He had a, you know, he had a sense, obviously, that's who they were. And everyone Turn a was, blind eye, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's no way that he didn't have a clue who Sam Christian was or Ron Harvey or Newton. You know, there's no way. You know, and so, and we'll talk about this later, but when Meaty Mims gets transferred from Philly to another mosque, you know, in the Midwest, there's no way Jeremiah Shabazz was not aware of that. Right. But when Jeremiah Shabazz told the Philadelphia Inquirer famously, when he's finally asked about this in 73 or 74, he's, and somebody asked, well, hey, what are, that, what are all these gangsters doing in your mosque? And his famous quote, and I'm paraphrasing, was, well... I don't monitor what people do in my mosque or why, mm -hmm. where their proceeds come from. You know, you, you don't go down to the, you know, the Catholic parish priest and ask him if mobsters are giving him money. So to me, it's the same thing. Yes. You know, he had a point because no one really was doing it. No, so, it's totally right. It's totally yeah. true. It's, it's, as I said, it's the, the misguided romanticism that we have for Italians. It was being done in the black communities. And we have to assume that, you know, when you look at really the, 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 the whole group, it was very similar to the mob. And I think it's important to talk about the street tax that they had. And, you know, it's funny because you mentioned Shabazz. Do you buy into the story about the do for self story where, you know, Jeremiah would kind of, he had this lingo where he would kind of always say, he would leave it kind of open, open-ended where someone would kind of talk about doing something. He would talk about do for self. What was do for self? and What did that mean? <laughs> well, you, you said you saw the uh, BET American Gangster episode back in 2007 that was based on Black Brothers Incorporated. There, there's a there's a great scene in there where uh, they asked the the producer Henry Shipper was awesome, and he interviewed so many people for that thing, and so he actually got access to members of the nation uh, of Temple Twelve back then, and. Uh, one of the things he he, he had Tyro uh, Tyree about this Tyree Johnson, a great reporter for KYW back then, and he also worked for the Philadelphia Daily News, and uh, he he interviewed somebody in Temple Twelve, Ty, just like Jim Nicholson, who you mentioned before from the Philadelphia Inquirer, Tyree Johnson and Kitty Caparello, they were two hounds from the Daily News. They covered all this back in the day and had a lot of guts because it was not it was not. First of all, it was dangerous, and it was not politically correct back then even to talk about this. So anyway, Terry Johnson has that great story where uh, he interviewed uh, a gangster who said that when he got out of prison, he went to the temple like you're supposed to, and he met with Jeremiah Shabazz, and Jeremiah Shabazz put a gun on the table and said, do for self. So that way, you wouldn't be instructing somebody to commit crimes. So you're just saying money. whatever you do is up right. to you. Like, you know, like, I got you out of prison early. Yeah. And I'm going to protect you on the street. And, you know, you do for self. I mean, that, the understanding is you're going to kick back a part of whatever you get back to the mosque. And, of course, that's, that was going on for years. In fact, that, that street tax of Black Mafia guys shaking people down, which we can talk about later, um, was not only going back to the mosque with Shabazz in charge, that was going back after Shabazz left in 76 straight through at least the early 2000s. 
it was a typical organized crime and yet the public never heard about it yeah it was just a it was just a normal thing you know and it's interesting because one of the most brutal crimes that was really kind of early in, in kind of the creation once the black mafia was formed was directly derived from that street tax there was a furniture store on south street called du Brows. um they were doing business and they decided they weren't you know they were going to balk at the street tax they weren't going to do it and, and you know what i thought i was wanted to ask you about and i kind of want to talk about it then i'll ask you the question so basically on january 4th 1971 Sam Christian and, and, and folks decide that the brows need to be dealt with. They don't want to uh, submit to what we're wanting them to do. They don't want to pay the street tax. So eight black mafia members, including Robert Mims, who is called Nudie Mims, uh, they go into the brows in South Street. Now, keep in mind, South Street, for anyone that's not familiar with Philadelphia, when it comes into South Philadelphia, South Street is the main thoroughfare of businesses. Today, it's, it's full of clothing stores and concert halls and uh, cheesesteak spots and restaurants and all sorts of places and it was a, a high-end area it was where you know you know they had great candy spots and, and 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 furniture places and it was really kind of the the spot to be in south philadelphia up until this day um they basically entered the store posing as a customer um they pulled guns on 20 employees present basically hog tie them to the in the back of the store basically connected uh, by tape and electrical cord 13 employees are basically beaten uh, while others were shot uh, a janitor basically then comes up from a freight elevator. He shot and killed and employees are then doused with gasoline and set on fire. Um, and it was really a ruthless crime. They loot the offices and the stores, destroy some, destroy some of the evidence and flee the scene. The, the fire alarm then goes off um, and, you know, all sorts of things come from that. Now, Frank Rizzo, who, you know, kind of at the time was the police commissioner, um, was quoted as saying, according to, to a, a W.E.B. Griffin uh, novel on Philadelphia, basically talked about it was one of the most vicious crimes he'd ever seen. And I, I think at that point, it really kind of raised the eyebrows to what and who was doing this. But I'll ask you, and one of the questions that I always had was, and maybe then it was different, but South Street at this time was controlled by Philadelphia's Italian mafia. How was this allowed to be done? And how did... Uh, Bruno allowed street taxes in, on South Street. Was that part of a black mafia stronghold or what? Because from well, what I would it, understand, it, was that it, way up on South Street or was how did no, that? No, no, that was no, no. Urban lore was that west of South Street and for non Philadelphia and South Street, or, pardon, west is Broad Street. Uh, Broad Street for non Philadelphians is essentially 14th Street. And west of Broad was supposed to be black mafia territory. And east of Broad was supposed to be Bruno kind of Sure. Um, fourth and South, obviously, is not Black Mafia territory. That's always was my thing. Like, well, I never yeah. understood that. How was yeah, that well, allowed well, to be? Well, well, well they were crazy. Yeah, look, they didn't fear anybody. And, you know, I, I, <laughs> one of the best stories in Black Brothers is I got access to all the intelligence files. And back then, I was, I was also looking you know, the Bruno family, the Scarpa family, so I had everybody's stuff. And one of the funniest things, and I forget which Italian mobster it was, but one of the Italian guys went to the organized crime unit in Philly to complain about Philly's Black Mafia encroaching on their territory. I mean, it's just absurd. You know, here's a criminal coming in saying, hey, guys, this is ridiculous. We, there's sort of underground rules here, and they're, they're, they're coming on out there. But anyway, um, I, they, they just ignored that. That wasn't the only one, but that was the main one, where they literally just ignored territory um, for whatever reason. I don't know if they had gotten tipped off to the fact that there'd be money there, or if they were going after the owner. Who knows what their motivation was? Uh, as I wrote in the book, the motivation couldn't have been robbery because they chose an odd time for a robbery. January 4th is after the Christmas holiday. There's no money in the till. There's no money in the place. The whole, the whole, they, they don't steal anything from the people that they shoot and stack on top of each other before they set them on fire. Well, I, I think I think this was a good old fashioned message. You either get down or lay down, basically. Exactly. And right. as we know, um, get down or lay down is a, is a fascinating quote in this town because as I said, to this day, uh, I remember State Property. It was a movie Beanie Siegel did back in the 90s. Uh, they used Get Down or Lay Down. The Junior Black Mafia used it. Get Down or Lay Down is a quote that 
you either get down or you're gone. It's that simple. And I think it was a simple message. Um, as you said, there was no robbery. There was nothing. Uh, th this was a, a, to send a message. And the fact that it was done in South Philly, Italian mob territory really goes to show you. And again, by this time, drugs had become the main, one of the main sort. They had the street tax, but they were selling a lot of drugs too. And I think, you know, this was clearly the sent of message, as, as I think you kind of alluded to. The other thing, you, you alluded to this earlier. By 1971, Philly's Black Mafia could care less about how everyone else is getting their heroin. Heroin, again, for people who don't know, at that time was the drug. And Philly's Black Mafia had their own pipeline. They didn't need anybody else. This is where, this is where the movie American Gangster, they get, look, it's like anything in Hollywood, they, they it's part fiction, you know, goats for a reason, based on a true story. Uh, there are parts that are accurate, parts that are not. But the part that's accurate is there really was a direct pipeline for the first time ever for black gangsters to get their own opium and their own heroin. And so they didn't need Sicilians like they did before. So um, that's why they were thriving, too. It, it was, they, they had access to networks. To, so on top of the fact that law enforcement isn't looking at them, and they now have access to raw opium, it was a great combination. And going back to your earlier point, if you're a victim of extortion or robbery in the black community, or obviously or murder, they don't trust law enforcement. The PD and especially the FBI were engaged in all sorts of subversive activities. They really were, there really was COINTELPRO against black nationalist groups. So even people who didn't like what Philly's Black Mafia was doing, they didn't know where to go and they didn't know who to trust just kind of like present day Philadelphia, you just, you got to put up with it is what it is. Um, I mean, it happens all the time. If you study immigration, it's the same thing. That's why, you know, there's a great book called Space, Time, and Organized Crime written by Alan Bach, and he makes this argument in the book. Organized crime doesn't change. The sociology of organized crime doesn't change. All that changes is time, space. And, and uh, in our case, what immigrant group is coming over they don't trust the government because they're coming from terrible places. They don't speak the language. They've not been assimilated yet. They don't know who to trust. And they're the ones who are extorted by their own. It's the same pattern forever. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, kind of getting off topic just a little bit, even like um Albanian, right? So like Albanians are a very similar group. I mean, they came over in the 2000s, you know, from Kosovo or, or wherever. They settled in places like the Bronx or wherever. And you know, don't speak the language, aren't fitting in, don't fit in. Uh, they go to school, they don't fit in there. Um, they start to have kind of a chip on their shoulder, create groups. And before you know it, they're a full-fledged kind of quasi six family in New York City. And, you know, yeah, it, it's, such a, it's, a, it's such a fascinating argument. And, you know, when you look at this case at DuBrow's, it was really kind of the first real kind of public thing. And, you know, when you look at yeah, but just, just to be clear, yeah. the nobody in law enforcement looked at that as a black right. mafia crime. Yeah. They just didn't know the syndicate even existed. Sure, sure. And when you look at it, when with the eight people that did it, only three were charged. Uh, by this time, Robert Mims, uh, Nudie Mims, had fled to uh, Detroit. Uh, he basically became the bodyguard to Elijah Muhammad at that point, uh, yeah. and, and kind of goes a different way, if you will. They begin to continue to sell. Uh, heroin. They be, continue to uh, control everything in black neighborhoods. They continue to ascend to the top of, of black organized crime. And in, as you said, and you made a great point about by this point, they really didn't need anyone else. They had a direct pipeline to people like Frank Matthews, who was selling heroin at, at an unbelievable rate. And in Philadelphia, he had a connection, a guy called Tyrone Palmer, uh, fat Tyrone Palmer. He was basically known as uh, Mr. Millionaire, as they would call him. And in 1972, Tyrone Palmer's down in Atlantic City. And we we connected this in the Nikki Scarfa show. I'll continue to say this. And you know this. Atlantic City is basically the little – it's right. If, if you're from Philly or from the area, you go to the Jersey Shore. Atlantic City's uh, directly connected to Philadelphia. And whether you're black, white, it doesn't matter. Uh, and at this time in Atlantic City, there was a great – urban renaissance you know places like the club harlem were created um and they were a great place to go uh for black acts you know billy paul was there the night uh, this all happened so on easter sunday in 1972 in club harlem tyrone palmer's down there with some associates 
Um, you know, I'm sure we could probably imagine had a big time entourage. He had uh, some great seats. He was enjoying some music. Um, and again, he was the direct connection between Frank Matthews uh, and the streets. He was the, the, the heroin supplier in Philadelphia. And he was connecting to the Black Mafia. He basically uh, got into a beef with Sam Christian and the Black Mafia. And at that point, keep in mind, there were up to 900 people in the Club Harlem that night. Uh, Sam Christian and other Black Mafia members basically go in and basically commit a mass shooting. Uh, they go in and start opening fire. They kill Tyrone Palmer. They kill a few of his bodyguards and they kill three women and injure 20 people. Okay, so this is a mass shooting, basically, in the 70s. Now, again, there were up to 900 people in that building. Why don't you tell us, Sean, how many people came forward with information on this crime? <laughs> but by the way, before I answer your question, if anyone has ever seen the movie Scarface starring, starring Al Pacino, right. then there's a scene where Al Pacino is slumped down, all coked up, at a booth near the stage. That's what happened in the Club Harlem. <laughs> Only the difference was there was an entire failing of people, including Fat Pie Palmer and his hero and his bodyguard. Um, nobody came forward. They had one or two people originally give statements. Oh, by the way, you didn't ask this question, but as I describe in the book, the Black Mafia guys went across the street and had drinks and watched the cops show up. <laughs> They, they, they were so used to being untouchable, Sam Christian especially. But anyway, um, one witness especially came forward, gave a detailed statement. So Sam Christian was indicted, and immediately that witness retracted his or her statement, and uh, his indictment was released, and uh, you know he was not even charged, let alone, uh, <laughs> let alone convicted on that. Uh, you know, the person conveniently forgot what he or she, I'm pretty convinced it was a she, I forget, but I think it was a she, I think she forgot what she said, and she, she couldn't testify. It's really fascinating. That's how, you know, horrified and scared people were of these guys. Well, well the it, thing it, is, uh, look, we're talking about now we're, you know, up in 72. If you're in Black Philly or you're in Black South Jersey, you know all about these guys. Mm -hmm. They have shot or killed so many people. Not adversaries, by the way, witnesses, family members of witnesses, they were totally unlike anything people had ever seen before. And by the way, I, in my first book, which was actually a textbook, I actually have a chart of all the people the Black Mafia killed. You can't do that for the Bruno family or the Scarfo family. No. It, they're, like, especially with the Bruno family, yeah, there might be a state in, a, in an underground war between Italian mobsters. But you're not going to have 40 or 50 people killed by them over five years or 10 years. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, the really, Black Mafia was killing people all over the place. And it's really just ineptness by you know, Philadelphia authorities. And, and that's really when I think th this became kind of a, an issue where New Jersey, the Atlantic City police and, 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 and you know, police in that area kind of said, look, we need some help on this. We go to the feds. I guess the ATF gets involved. And that's kind of when I think the beginnings are starting to see that this is a organized group of people. They're killing a lot of people, as you said. And it wasn't, we're, we're only kind of highlighting the major murders. But as Sean alluded to, this is a group that's responsible for, you know, four dozen-ish murders in Philadelphia and in New Jersey. Um, and again, as this continues and all this stuff is being uh, done, drugs are being shoveled into communities. Drugs are being shoveled into people's arms. Uh, people are continuing to commit cr criminality, and it is basically being veiled by the fact that they're being committed in mosques. They're being done through the veil of religion. And at this point, they're still part of the nation of Islam. And this is where we get, I think, to the real infamous, not that the Tyrone Palmer murder was an infamous or the Du Browse, but this is where I think for the Black Mafia, it really became, we can't avoid what this group is doing and in this point in 1973 early 1973 um there was a group of not radical muslims but another muslim group uh called hanafi it was hanafi muslims they were a group led by this guy hamas abdul khalis he's basically responsible and as you know uh converted uh kareem uh to islam um he was i guess you could say 
kind of, I think as we do now, uncovering that some of the teachings that Elijah Muhammad was putting out there, what the, the nation was doing, I think he, as I'm sure you would agree with, was kind of understanding that it was all kind of uh, false prophetish in a way. Oh, sure. Well, there's a great anecdote in the book where Kareem says that Muhammad Ali actually, you know, which, by the way, he would never call Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali. He always called him Cassius Clay. He said, I'll humor calling him Cassius X, but I'm not going to call him Muhammad Ali because he is not a Muslim. That's a quote from Kareem Abdul Jabbar back in the 70s. He is not a Muslim. And his argument was, yeah, the nation reached out to me, but I'm looking for Islam. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a peaceful religion. What they're doing is politics and all sorts of other stuff. That is not Islam. And I think so, so Kareem, Kareem and, and Muhammad Ali were not friends at all. Right. And I think the Hanafi is basically aligned with the Sunni Islam, yeah. which is yeah. your traditional Islam. It's, you know, again, your normal, you know, mainstream Muslim religion. By this yeah. point, the nation had really converted itself into this like warped um, kind of, you know, random sect of Islam. And, you know, Hamas Abdul Khalis basically sends out a letter to every temple and Moss and basically says, look, this stuff is gangster stuff. You're harming Islam. You're re and he's really doing something that I think was brave at the time. He's saying, look, this is not Islam. This is, this is really hurting um, our faith. This is, this is bringing negative light to our faith. Um, and he sends this letter out. He, he, and again, he, he talked about Elijah Muhammad personally, he called him uh, all sorts of, of different damning names and all sorts of things. Um, so Sam Christian, who was, again, part of the Fruit of Islam, the paramilitary force, and was a criminal and an awful killer in his own right, he basically, I don't know if he's instructed or he just takes it upon himself, maybe you know that, um, but him and a hit squad basically get this letter and say, all right, he's got to go. We can't allow him to continue to purvey this to our people. Uh, he's damning uh, Elijah Muhammad's name. Uh, he's got to go. So they basically go down to Washington, D.C. And by this point, the Hanafis have a compound. It's set up in Washington, D.C. Kareem actually donated the house to the Hanafis at this point. Um, and they're looking for Hamas and Khalis at this compound. They go down there. Um, they get to the place and find out that he's not present. So you would imagine, OK, they leave. They'll sit around and wait for him to come home. Um, they basically commit a heinous, awful crime and basically kill every person in the house. And when I say every person in the house, they basically shoot every person, two adults, five children, as young as infants. They basically murder them. And you talk about in one of the, and I know in the book and in some of the, the, the works that you've done, talk about the police when they come across this crime scene. Well, what they did, they didn't just shoot the adults. They shot them as they were kneeling in closets. That was their MO. Um, and then the kids, there were the, the kids, including the nine day old, the baby, who was literally a nine day old baby, um, they drowned them instead. And one of the police officers, there, there was blood all over the upstairs. So one of the police officers went into the basement to wash his hands, to get away from all the blood. One of the, especially, there was blood smeared all over our staircase. And he gets to the basement, and he, walk, he goes to wash his hand in the sink, and he sees what he thinks is a doll, and it turns out the doll is a nine-day-old baby that the Black Mafia guys have killed. I mean, it, it is just heinous. It is really just cold. It is uh, disturbing. It is really sociopathic. And... You know, I remember watching the, the American Gangster show and, and they talked about, I guess, and I'm sure you can allude to this as well. One of the people involved in this heinous crime were basically balking in a way at killing the children. And well, what, yeah, well, no, what happened was the black mafia killers who were there, they were there to kill Hamas and the police. They had no problem with that. Sure. And maybe the grownups, because in their opinion, 
you know, they were false prophets, they weren't listening to the right leader, all that, you know, you can imagine their motivation. So when John Clark, another black mafia guy, ordered the murder of the babies, that's when people balked, including James Bubbles Price, that's who I quote in the book. Um, and he said, he, his argument was, wait, we're, we're, why are we killing the kids? They, they're not even witnesses. They don't, they don't, they're not fighting with us. They're not arguing against us. And they can't even be witnesses to the murder. So why are we killing them? Right. And the famous quote from John Clark is, they have to be killed because they quote, the seed of the hypocrite is in them. Right. So that's, why that, that's why that chapter is called the seed of the hypocrite. They're the wrong Muslim set. Yeah, it's basically insinuating that they have the, the rotten gene in them and that they yeah. have to die as well. Um, yeah. It's really a, a heinous. And, and this is where when you connect back to, to, to really what was going on by these people, and they, they were heinous, awful criminals. Um, they were terrible people. They, they killed women. They killed children. It wasn't just like with the Italians where they were killing people in the life or whatever. Uh, no, this was, we're going to kill anyone that gets in our way. Um, and it really had nothing to do with any drugs. It had nothing to do with treat tax. It was just simply you disrespected who we think is a leader uh, and, and you're going to be basically slaughtered because of it. Um, and, you know, that's where I think the increased law enforcement activity, the media attention, all sorts of stuff starts to really kind of not necessarily come down on them, but they're still committing crimes. I mean, let, let's not just say that they're not committing crimes. They're still doing things. But yeah, the difference is because they're in D.C., it's now an interstate crime, so the FBI gets involved. Sure, right. And so now they're going to get resources against them that they've never had to deal with before. But by this point, you know, and this is 1973, they commit that in, in basically early 1973. By June of 1973, uh, there was another big time thing to deal with. There was a guy uh, who was a big time drug dealer in South Jersey, Major Cox. And he was kind of, uh, interestingly enough, he was kind of a, um, a, a socialite, if you will. He was kind of a, he ran for mayor of Camden. He was known to a lot of people. He's friends with Muhammad Ali. Um, he, he had kind of a, a really good life. He lived in a beautiful home. He was, and, and look, you know this, in the nation, they preach to this day, um, you know, anonymity. Uh, we're not going to kind of uh, flaunt our opulence. They don't do any of that kind of stuff. And I think at the time, Major Coxon was just part of what they were doing. But Major Coxon was a drug dealer and he balks on a debt that he owes the Black Mafia. Um, you know, and he had ties to a lot of different people and he was immersed in, in, in urban politics and stuff. And he was kind of a, an important person. Um, he basically has this uh, debt that he owes the Black Mafia. So in June of 73, uh, Ron Harvey and, and, and other Black Mafia members go to his home in Cherry Hill, um, and his family are there as well. Um, they basically uh, bound and tie them up and execute Major Coxon. Uh, they also kill uh, various other people in the family, um, mainly his, I believe, his a daughter, his wife, uh, other folks in the family. However, one of the children survives i believe and i think crawls to a neighbor's is that correct he actually doesn't crawl he hops because they were all hogtied That's uh, right. hands and feet and so he jumped uh hopped, hopped through the woods to a neighbor's house banged his head against the rear door and got them uh to let them know by the way he the, the whole problem with the black mafia guys whenever they were involved in these shootings some of the times they used uh bullets that were with old lead. So in this case, one of the survivors had in that case, and then especially in the Hanafi case we just talked about, Amina Khalees, she survived even though she was blinded in one eye and uh, I don't know if so, she was paralyzed, but obviously more than traumatized watching her babies being killed. She was the lone witness in that case. And it's one of those odd things where if you're, you know, your listeners are trying to understand, well, how can we know about these sorts of things? There is a really weird historical thing. Philly's Black Mafia, on more than one occasion, used bullets that had lead in them that was too soft, that was old, which meant when they shot people, it didn't penetrate like they were expecting. And because of that, we were actually able to have victims who could tell us this history. 
Interesting. Fascinating. I, did, I actually didn't know that. That's that's fascinating. To, yeah, to the hear. bullets get soft after the lead gets old. Right, right. Fascinating. Yeah, so by that point, you know, th- these are major high-profile killings. And, you know, decades later, they would actually call – um, this major coxon hit uh, and, and his family being killed is one of the most violent crimes of the 20th century. The Philadelphia Inquirer, I believe, called it that. Um, by this point, um, there's so much publicity. There's so much, uh, so many researchers going into the Black Mafia. Uh, by this point, um, Sam Christian becomes uh, part of the FBI's most wanted list. Um, he had been arrested, I think, uh, almost over 30 times at this point and was charged with uh, basically seven murders, but there were no witnesses that were willing to testify against uh, Sam Christian. Um, and to to the date of his death, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, Sam Christian never went to prison for, for really a, that extended period. Like, he didn't die in prison like he should have. Um, but but all the heat was coming down on uh, the Black Mafia by this point. Well, the thing is, uh, I, I, I want to pause on that moment for a second. Don't forget, well, think about some of the ridiculous stories, and we're just doing the highlights here. For people who are not familiar with those Black Mafia, the idea that they're not just part of some of the biggest crime stories in Philly history, but national history. Sure. When they killed all the Hanafis in D.C., that was the largest mass murder in D.C. at that time. When they go and kill a mayoral candidate in New Jersey, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the film American Hustle, uh, starring, I think Bradley Cooper's in that movie, but it, anyway, it's a big movie. It's okay, that the focus is on Angelo Arrichetti. Well, that was that was the person who beat Major Coxon in the candidacy for Mayor Mayor Camden. So these are huge crimes, and nobody at the time was talking about a group called Philadelphia's Black Mafia. The individual crimes obviously were so noteworthy they would be in the news. But there's no chance, zero chance, that if the names were Gambino, Scarfo, Colombo, they'd be national scandals. And nobody even knew they were related. It's the same guys. It really is fascinating. I, I've always looked back on it. And one of the reasons I've always been fascinated by this group is, and, and I'm going to talk about kind of how it connects it today in a little bit. But yeah, by this point, you know, there's so much heat coming down. There's so many things coming down that, you know, all in all, you know, guys like Ron Harvey go to prison. Sam Christian ends up going to prison as well. I want to say he was released in 1989. And I believe at the time, the junior black mafia was basically in control of Philadelphia. And and he waged some sort of attempt to gain control. What do you know about that? You're right. Sam Christian never served time for any of the murders that you mentioned. In fact, by the way, you don't know this. I never thought about it. Sam Christian reached out to me um, to write a book. And the problem was he wouldn't admit to any of the murders. And my argument was, well, then what is there to talk about? Right. (laughs) I'm sure you're a badass, but but what is the story? Well, anyway, um, he only served time for, he made a mistake. He shot a cop in New York City during a robbery. And of course, unlike all the regular civilians that he was shooting over the years, the cop was perfectly willing to testify, and that's why Sam Christian served time in prison in the 80s. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating because, as you said, the main crimes, the, the, the big-time murders that he committed, it was up until he, he messed with a cop, and that's when he went away. I just want to kind of throw in, by 74, um, everything was fracturing with, with the Black Mafia. Um, you know, Basically, at that point, and even into the seven, uh, 73, as cited in, in, in one of your works, um, there was a, a law enforcement um, official that said, the Black Mafia is real. It's not a cop fantasy. Newspapers, pipe dreams, or movie myth. It is a Black criminal syndicate that has been growing unchecked in Philadelphia for the last five years. It is expanded and involved in a powerful crime cartel with chains of command, enforcers, soldiers, financiers, regular business meetings and assigned territories. It also specializes in narcotics, extortion, murder, with minor interests in loan sharking, numbers, and prostitution. It has a war chest that bankrolls drugs and gambling and buys the best lawyers. So basically, at that point, there's a connection that it is a real group. It is a real uh, organization. And in 1974, 21 members and affiliates are arrested and indicted in an early morning raid by federal drug agents and the Justice Department. Uh, the Black Mafia would basically fracture at that point. Now, keep in mind, it did roll into the 80s. 
a guy called Bo Baines kind of took control of the of the group. Um, but talk to me kind of just about what happened with Ron Harvey, uh, what happened with, with Sam Christian in the cop case. Sure. Well, Harvey dies in federal prison in 1977 for his roles in the Hanafi and Coxon killings. Christian serves time, like we talked about. He gets out in 88, 89, gets arrested again for crack possession, but nothing spectacular. Um, as you alluded to, he and Robert Moody Mims, the person who served life in prison for the DuBrow's Furniture Store case you talked about, were un, in, uh, how would you say, informal mentors to the Junior Black Mafia, which was from 85 to 92. That whole cast of characters that got prosecuted in 74, like you mentioned, some of them, I don't actually probably the majority of them got out again and immediately immersed themselves into the underworld again and were all organizing crime all throughout the 1980s. Keep in mind, when you correctly said that the group was not the same after 84, but neither was Scarpo or any of the sure. attorneys. Yeah. By then, federal law enforcement had figured out how to use wiretapping and all the omnibus crime control act of 68, you know, so things like witness protection, witness immunity, all that. So organized crime has never been anything like it was since the mid eighties for that reason. So when they get out, they were still prominent in the drug trade and extortion, but not, they didn't control entire sections of the city like they did for 20 years. Right. And as you said, uh, you know, and, and I pointed out at that point, what's, you know, Sam uh, Christian goes away, Ron Harvey goes away. All those guys go away. Uh, this guy, Bo Baines kind of takes over, you know, up until Bo Baines death uh, in uh, I want to say in early, I think 2012, I believe right. um, he actually had a um, he had a couple of halal stores. I believe in Philadelphia, yes, I <laughs> kind of like soul food, halal food, um, and you know, it was kind of looked at as kind of a, a man of the community. But um, I, I kind of quickly want to touch on just kind of the, the, the tentacles that we still see today in this town. Uh, and in the '80s, once Bo Baines kind of goes away, there's another group that's formed called the Junior Black Mafia, the JBM. Um, and it's started by a guy called Aaron Jones. Uh, is basically conceived in the late 80s and basically was created during the crack e epidemic. And it's funny because when you look at how they were created, it was a direct derivative of the Black Mafia. And they were obsessed with La Cosa Nostra and the gangster uh, kind of ethos. And I, I remember reading about Aaron Jones that he was obsessed with the movie God, The Godfather. Like he was fascinated by it. He basically ran his organization like that. He basically saw himself as capo di tutti capi, if you will, basically the Vito Corleone, if, if you will. Um, they uh, com committed all sorts of crimes, uh, murders, all sorts of things, uh, up until uh, the 2000s or, or the late 90s when, and they even, I mean, they moved around with Joey Molino and, and all sorts of people in, in Philadelphia at the time. Uh, Aaron Jones is actually uh, still in prison. He's on death row, I believe, in, 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 in uh, state prison here. Um, but then you look at things that were created after that uh, with guys like Kabani Savage, who we're going to do a show on here soon. Uh, I'm still kind of putting that together. But Kabani Savage, who I, I think, in my opinion, is probably one of the most uh, disturbed individuals in the history of this state, frankly. And I know you know a little bit about Kabani. Um, <laughs> And you look at today, um, you know, just the tentacles of the black mafia. It was really a purveyor of crime that you look at some of the grandkids of these people. Uh, they're out purveying crime in these areas. And I know you talked to me before we started the show about just today and how much the black mafia has influenced crime in the 80s and the 90s up until today. Well, the thing is, like you mentioned, Kabani Savage. Kabani Savage is the only Phil, uh, Pennsylvania, not Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, on federal death row. Right. Uh, his history is remarkable. I actually have an entire part of my website <laughs> that's what it did because he, as you said, he's just different. Um, there, you know, it's one thing to say that Sam Christian murdered seven people and had fifty some arrests. Which, by the way, for your listeners, understand this. It's sort of like speed. We all don't get pulled over every time we speed. So if you've been arrested 40 times, you're busy. Yeah, it's really, that, that's so, that's funny that you say that. It, it really is incredible. I, 
weirdly enough, I, I, you know, you, you, I've never been, you know, I, I've never been arrested. I, I can't imagine being arrested 40 times. But, you know, you, you mentioned um, Cabani and I mentioned Cabani. Do you see a lot? I mean, there are very similar people, Sam Christian and Cabani. They did a lot of, I mean, and Cabani, one of the, 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 I think the things that he was willing to do is he was also willing to kill kids. He was going to fight, he, you know, and we'll talk about what he'd do a show on him, but. He was a dangerous person. I mean, he would kill witnesses. He would kill. Uh, the thing is, well, oh, no, 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 there is no doubt that Cavani Savage was every bit, if more twisted than Sam Christian. The only thing I would say about that is Cavani Savage was just a high profile drug dealer. Yeah. Whereas, my goodness, Sam Christian was involved in financial scams. I mean, I detail so much of that in Black Brothers where. We want to focus on the murders, and I get that. But these people had figured out how to manipulate all sorts of federal initiatives. They were getting federal grants. They were creating so-called community development and community action agencies that were all fronts for drug activity, confusing the hell out of politicians and of victims. What, what the Black Mafia was doing over that 10-year, 15-year period was just fascinating. It really, uh, really is. And, and so, like, Bonnie Savage was, and by the way, there was a great Daily News headline years ago, for Savage, the name fits. Uh, it really that, does. Yeah. Remember, that headline, you give him a gold star because it's true. You know, where, where he's caught on wiretaps, you know, hoping that the uh, the family, when, when they visited one of the people, one of the informants he had killed through a, an arson, he hopes they brought barbecue sauce to the funeral. Um, he's just a ruthless guy. And so anyway, he's, he's on a different level than a lot of the guys we talked about, which is saying something. Yeah. I mean, and this is a guy that was caught on wiretap talking about, um, I want to hit little infants and children in the face with a bat. I mean, th th this is a, and, and I always thought, you know, one of the more ruthless individuals in that organization was uh, his sister, who's doing a life sentence as well, who, um, you know, once they firebomb that house and kill all those children, um, you know, she basically says, you know, fuck them you know it's really just cold calculated disturbing behavior yeah and then listen and, that, and i'm sure you'll do this when you do your episode on savage but for your listeners to understand none of this was just offhand not that there's a defense of doing something like that offhand this was calculated plan they talked about it bragged about they bragged about beforehand and after yeah no it's so true and and again all these are direct kind of derivatives from the original black mafia which again is largely not reported about in america look, the, the thing that, look i'm not saying this to brag I, I, I i'm just telling you when i would do lectures for the fbi the dea all the federal agencies back oh my gosh straight through 2014 and i only stopped because i moved to south carolina i would do a lecture on this topic and the people in the crowd thought it was relevant, not because the federal was cute history, but because, as you said, relatives, friends, were all still in the business. And even the Black Mafia guys who are serving sentences in prison, well, they're mentors. And for people, you know, like your audience probably knows this, in organized crime, you assume at some point you're going to be incarcerated, which means you better play right by the rules of the street. You have to know who's going to take care of you in prison, what they expect when you're out, what that means on the street and in and in prison. And that that whole sociology has never changed and it's still going on today. You know, when you and when you look at and I and I have to ask you this, it's kind of a final question, just kind of as a whole. Um, I, I've I've been on record as talking uh, significantly about kind of the failure that the war on drugs has become. And, and I think it is a main proponent of why we have so much violence in this country in American cities. But let me ask you, if not for the Philadelphia Black Mafia, do you think the city of Philadelphia is a much safer place today? Oh, you know what? I have done literally hundreds of these over the years. No one has ever asked me that question. If not for Philadelphia's Black Mafia. Be because safe. how many groups formed and then formed after that? And again, I know a lot of it has to do with just the, the failure of the drug trade and that it's become just a a war on the poor and, and they've basically been uh, thrown into just doing it but isn't philadelphia significantly safer without people like here's, here's, okay i i i'm answering this question with a minute of it being asked or answered asked but 
I'll say yes, because on the one hand, you're tempted to say, obviously, there's going to be a void in certain networks, especially drugs. And you might be tempted to say, well, obviously, that's a ridiculous proposition. Somebody's going to fill the void. Yes, I can see that. However, the people I know who are running sections of the city today are only feared because of their histories and their connections. Yeah. And if you could somehow get rid of those connections, and if you know, if you or I just try organizing crime at you know Fifth and Diamond tomorrow in North mm-hmm. Philly, well, you can't do that without some street cred, which we wouldn't have. So early on, there would absolutely be less violence because people wouldn't fear us. And I, that's a tough one. Then again, we would have to commit violence to get people to fear us. So I don't know. That's a good one. Yeah, it's really fascinating to think about. I, I often think about that in, in today, you know, just with, you know, and again, a lot of it has to do with just the the, the, the war on drugs and what, what where we kind of are with it. But um, I, I have to think that, that the city would be a lot safer, uh, at least historically, even into the 90s and 2000s. I mean, there were you know, even with guys like Ace Capone, who was a major drug trafficker in Philadelphia. I mean, and you look at interestingly enough today, the final thing we'll kind of talk about is, you know, some of the connections to, to politics that that we see. You know, there was a guy, um, Shamshuddin Ali, who was was a black mafia member who's now a, 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 a leader in, in government and was a leader in government in this town. I think, what was he, the leader, the he, he headed the prisons, I believe, in, in Philadelphia? Well, he was... He was technically speaking, he was the head of the mosque, the mosque at 47 Wyoming in West Philly. That was his formal thing, but he was also on the board of the Philadelphia prisons. Right, that's what it and, was. Yeah. But now the reason that he's interesting to people who study organized crime. See, here's the thing. I'm assuming many of your listeners are focused on Italians. So people who focus on Italian history, they get labor unions and labor racketeering. They get, you know, waterfront corruption. They can understand all that. Well, this is a different version of that because James Dean Ali's expertise was, okay, you're in organized crime. You're going to shake people down. You're going to pay back for the mosh. You're in organized crime. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. You're going to get pinched. Well, you're going to go in prison. You're going to need protection in prison. Well, who's going to give you the protection? Well, I tell this great story. There was a great FBI investigation. In fact, it was also a, um, oh my gosh. It was another federal agency. Anyway, they, they did an investigation involving labor in the 80s, and they discovered that the corrupt Philadelphia Roofers Union, local 30 leaders, when they got sentenced to prison in their big corruption scandal, they didn't go to Italian gangsters. They went to Sheen Sabina Ali to arrange for protection for their prison stays. That's how huge he was with protection in the system. And of course, the way the racket works, you then want to get out early. Well, there's an, a quote-unquote early release program that you have to fill out certain paperwork. You have to show you've got a job lined up. With, oh, well, son of a gun. They can provide that for you. And when you come out, because you now owe, because you got a job and you got out early, you have to pay back the mosque. It's genius. And, and really, reason, like, this is not complicated, folks. If this was Italians, everyone would be talking about it. No, and, and it's, it's really... Gangsters, and- it's, it's just nothing. Everything they did had kind of a, 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 a reason. Everything was done. Everything was, and it was done all through the auspice of like mosques or, yes. or whatever. It was all kind of. And, and look, that's why I get upset. I don't mind. You and I could talk about DuBrow's and Coxon and mm-hmm. all the other ridiculous murders. I mean, they were so outrageous. I get that. But it minimizes how unbelievably complicated and consequential this was. And it, it, it doesn't highlight the fact that the law enforcement community, and especially my colleagues in academia and the media, totally dropped the ball. And when she and Sabinali got caught on those wiretaps in the late 90s and early 2000s, which would, normally would have been a humongous national scandal, you're not going to tell me that if Nikki Scarfo or Angela Bruno wasn't caught on wiretaps, shaking down drug dealers to take money to Frank Rizzo, that would have been everywhere. And yet that happened in this story, and it wasn't a story. I have two questions, and I kind of want to put a bow on this. Um, as uh, Sean alluded to, Ron Harvey died in prison in the mid-'70s, really didn't do much time, died pretty quickly. Uh, Sam Christian actually passed away uh, just recently. In 2016, yep. you wrote, a, wrote some stuff for the uh, Philly Mag about that. Um, mm-hmm. Initially enough, um, 
Sam, they called him Baya. Uh, he died. Yeah. Uh, Samuel really? Baya, his Muslim name was Baya, B E Y A. Yeah. Sulam, I think Suleiman Bey, right? Was his name? Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he basically died with, with very little fanfare. He died in a, you know, weirdly enough, you know, for most of the, the you know, in the 90s, 2000s, didn't do any prison time, died in a nursing home, had yep. some declining health and, uh, you know, passed away. They had Janazza for him and everything. And uh, let me ask you this, and this is kind of the final question. When we look back on crime in this town, and in this city, we could talk about serial killers. We could talk about Nikki Scarfo. We could talk about, um, you know, the... Um, the Lex Street massacres and some of the, the terrible things that have happened in this town, Kabani Savage. Where would you rank Sam Christian as far as fear? In that you would have to agree, he's probably the, the most um, scary criminal in the history of this town. You would have to agree. Him and Ron. And you're good at these. I'm not joking. For, for you listeners who don't know about me, I'm not joking. I have done hundreds of these. I, I, you're asking questions I've never. Well, Matt, I think because I have a good connect, like I know a lot about Philly, so I, I don't know. Um, where would I rank him? Uh, like also, if you're making, if, if you're creating a list on the, and, and look, Nikki Scarpa was a sociopath lunatic, but if you're making a, a list of lunatics and you can't include like, because there have been some serial killers, but, no, but like, the serial killers, people didn't know about them. So, you know, you wouldn't be afraid of Gary Hyden if you just didn't know. Right. The difference right. is Gary Hyden was like a regular. Mickey Scarfo had a reputation for that, just like Sam Christian. So I get that. I get the question. I, I have to tell you, you know, I, I, I mean, there's a great anecdote in Black Brothers that, you know, he would go up to a street corner to play craps when craps was a thing on street corners in Black Philly. Well, and it people, still is actually, and, and people would just start throwing their money at him, and he goes, "No, no, no, I'm not here to rob you. I just want to play." Yeah. Was, even among other criminals, he was feared. We now, kind of had a, and and I weirdly always connect the wire to something, but he had an Omar Little feel to him in a way. Like Omar Little was obviously very feared. He wasn't a, a major lunatic when it came to just leading like a a black organized crime group, but you know. I've heard about that as well. And the book is, is so succinct in talking about it. Um, so you got to put him up towards the top, right? Oh, no, no, no. Look, look, if I'm being very serious about this. I, he's absolutely among the top people. Just because, like I say, you could, Tyree Johnson in that documentary had a great line. He said that that was a name you just didn't even mention. Well, it's funny. People are afraid of him. Sean, this is why I love you, man. Because I was going to end the show with that quote, how, uh, <laughs> yeah, that you, you mentioned Tyree Johnson, Daily News reporter, great reporter. He he had a quote about Sam Christian and Ron Harvey and basically said, those are just two people you just didn't mention. Yeah. You're even afraid to say their names because you didn't want them to get mad at you. It's true. I mean, look, I, I, it's, it's so hard having this conversation in 2021 because back then the FBI – armed reporters they couldn't believe jim nicholson and tyree johnson were going after philly's black mafia and told them if you're going to do this you have to carry a weapon and so tyree johnson literally was given a weapon yeah it's fascinating and one other thing and I, we kind of connect it to today um just a week ago march 30th 2021 or a couple weeks ago um late late early april uh A.R. Ab, who was a very popular rapper in Philadelphia, uh, he was sentenced to 45 years in federal prison. Um, I know to this day he has a song called Black Mob. One of his cohorts, Dark Low, uh, had a song called Ron Harvey Jr. So like these, these are these are guys that to this day, the name Ron Harvey, the name Sam Christian, people know them and they still have connection to today. So. Um, I I, that, that you're you're informing me. I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you have to check it well, out. Look, as, we're, as we're taping this, there's an epics show called Godfather of Harlem, and Sam Christian is being played by Method Man. That's that literally is airing right now, and and Method Man's first appearance was two nights ago. Yeah. No. It, and it's it's it all comes together, man. Um, what a great show. What what a fascinating episode. Just you know, really great conversation and i know a lot of people don't know about the black mafia so it, it's great that we were able to bring it to you uh sean really great stuff man i i urge anyone that that loves this topic or wants to hear more about uh the black mafia go check out black brothers inc i have the book on my coffee table i read it i've read it uh it's terrific it's got pictures all, all sorts of great stuff um and i also really quickly um 
go get the book about uh, Tim Donnie as well. Why don't you tell us about that? How did you come across that story and what made you get connected there? Sure. Well, ironically, I was out promoting Black Brothers Incorporated <laughs> and uh, somebody um, connected to the professional gambler in that case, Jimmy Batista, reached out to me. But that, that whole story is based in Philly. Donaghy, the referee, is from Delco, Delaware yeah. County, you know, uh, and as are his co-conspirators, Jimmy Batista, the pro gambler, and Tommy Martino, their mutual friend. And I thought I knew the story. And I said, look, man, I'm crazy busy. I'm on this media tour for Black Brothers Incorporated. I don't have time for this. And he said, no, no, just do me a favor. Meet Jimmy Batista. So I thought I knew the story. Ironically, I was facing death at that time. This is a great story. Uh, we meet at a restaurant. And I tell Batista, hey, listen, I have to sit at the back of this place facing the door. I have an exit over here. And Batista at the time said, no, I don't think you understand. I'm sitting there for his own reason. So we had our very first encounter. We were joking about who was sitting facing the door. Anyway, um, so I met with him. And within 20 minutes, I realized that the entire story on the NBA betting scandal that we were told in 2007 and 8 was wrong for reasons I explained in the book. Nobody ever had access to the FBI agents, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Batista, the pro gamblers, the betting records, the betting lines. And I just was paying attention to it like a normal sports fan. So, you know, you watch ESPN, you think, you know, well, turns out we didn't know anything. So um, I, I wound up writing that book. It was published in 2011. And so literally in a span of, you know, four years, I had two books on the bestsellers list, just almost by happenstance. I wrote Black Brothers because a colleague of mine thought I should, even though I fought him on it. And then that happened. And I wasn't looking to do that because I thought we knew the story. And it turns out that we did know the story. And you know, that's always been my claim to fame. I just like getting the real stuff, the real FBI files, access to the real yeah. intelligence. Really and well done. Real Thank you. But and by the way, if people, people, even if they don't want to buy the books, my my website, seanpatrickgriffin.net, S-E-A-N, Patrick Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N dot net, has all the information. I, I'm always afraid of being called a grifter. So generally speaking, anything of value with either of my projects, my big projects, you can do your own research. I post all the files. Um, one of the problems I have with media is they're not like academics. They don't cite sources. So I'm sick of the he said, she said stuff. It's all up there. And so I want people to know if I write it, that's what happened. Yeah, I, I can't I can't keep saying it. Just terrific stuff. Um, one of my favorites, uh, Sean Patrick Griffin. Uh, I'll put you in the category with the George Anastasias and the TJ Englishes and just great stuff. Uh, go get Black Brothers Inc. Go get uh, Gaming the Game. Just two great topics, two great things to talk about. Uh, maybe when we do the Kabani show, we'll have to get you back, uh, Sean, uh, here in a couple of weeks. Um, another fascinating character. Uh, that's it for the sit down. As always, uh, if you enjoy the show, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you uh, uh, comment. Make sure you tell anyone that would like it. Make sure you go follow the sit down on Twitter at the sit down seven always putting out really uh, interesting things about the mob, a lot of history stuff and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, make sure you uh, subscribe to it all. Uh, thanks again, Sean. Really great stuff. Thanks, Jeff. We'll talk to you next week. Here on the